Mesdames et messieurs, si vous voulez bien vous installer, merci. So, ladies and gentlemen, if you'd like to take your seats, please. Merci, mesdames et messieurs, s'il vous plaît. Voilà, merci. Ladies and gentlemen, if you don't mind taking your seats, please. Ladies and gentlemen, there are some seats at the front of the auditorium if you'd like to move forward. Thank you very much. I'd now like to hand the floor to Mrs. Martine Aubry, who's the mayor of Lille. So, is everybody seated? All good for everyone? Dear friends, I'm delighted with Marie-Pierre Bresson, who is in charge of culture at the city of Lille, to welcome you here this morning after our first contact yesterday evening at the town hall. First of all, I'd like to welcome Anne-Catherine Klebst, who is the deputy mayor of Dresden. And for us today here, she's the vice president of EuroCities and president of the Culture Forum, and she'll be talking to us in a few minutes. I'd also like to welcome all of the team, the general secretary of EuroCities, who's prepared uh, this forum with us. We're delighted to be able to welcome you for these two days together so that we can all have a more sustainable form of culture. So that, and the charter that the city of Lille has prepared uh, has been completed uh, with all of its twin cities, and uh, we have signed it. We call it the call from Lille, and the idea is that you should be able to make the same commitments as we have, but during that process, you said, you know, you're doing things that we're not doing and vice versa, and there are things that we can learn. So there are 140 representatives of 155 towns in 19 different countries, and this morning I was having a look at the list. Spain, from Ljubljana in Slovenia, to Brussels, from Leeds, Glasgow, Birmingham in Great Britain, and in Germany, Berlin, Munich, to Arezzo, Bolenta in Italy, at Athens in Greece. I can't mention the 55 cities, but I just wanted to mention the biggest of them. So for all of you who are here with us, you're all important for us. And you'll understand, as far as I'm concerned, all of the cities who are going to apply to be a European capital for culture. And uh, so we've got Bourges, Rouen, Reims, Montpellier, and Sète. So they're French cities. Uh, you know, I haven't forgotten you. I can see that you're here in the second to be applying. They're candidates. And uh, one of them, I hope, will be chosen by the authorities uh, in Europe. So I would like to thank everyone. Thank you all for being here. And thanks to EuroCities, I'm delighted that we're going to be meeting and talking about issues which really are very important to us. Lille has been involved for a very long time in the ecological transition. Without talking to you too much about what we've already done, I'd just like to say that uh, we were participating in the first Agenda 21 in France in 2000. And since then, we have reduced our We've also worked on housing, on nature in the cities, and also on culture. After the Agenda 21, we voted quite recently for our climate plan for 2021 through to 2027, and also for our local see us about it. It's a charter that we asked promoters and developers to sign for social and public housing, and it's got to respect and as low carbon as possible. And thanks to all of these commitments and thanks to all of the work that we've been doing, a few days ago, we announced our energy sobriety plan. I think that all of the cities in Europe are starting to work on this. We were ready, and that explains why here, normally, dear Bruno, who is the DG of the Palais des Beaux-Arts, normally here, we should be at 18 degrees in this room. And when there's a temporary exhibition, and I'm just going to warn you uh, if you lend us any of your worries. So we've been doing all of this with all of the commitment that we've made in lots of fields. And our aim is to reduce our carbon footprint 
When I say that, we've got to reduce greenhouse gas emissions in town by 45 percent by 2030. And we're hoping to aim for carbon neutrality before 2050. That's our objective in any case. Now, culture couldn't uh, remain on the sidelines. And here in the city of Lille, we have various establishments that were really forerunners. The opera, which was designated as being ISO 121. Uh, it's the first opera in France to have that certification. And the we have uh, the same thing for Roubaix. But here, Bruno, in the Palais des Beaux-Arts, the director and his town have been working on this idea of being eco-responsible for a very long time in museums. And I'm going to give you two examples. In the eco-design of exhibitions, the last two that we organized, Goya experience uh, using two paintings. Now, I hope, uh, quick parenthesis here, I hope you'll have the opportunity to visit the museum. And uh, that we have a fantastic Renaissance collection and especially an excellent collection after Florence, after Firenze. So we're very proud of that. And so if you have the opportunity to go and see them, it's from Goya's early and older paintings, Reves and Irreveres. It's from them that we have organized the Goya experience. Now we've got 80 paintings. Most of them have come from other. The latest exhibition that we've had here as part of our Utopia season, the Magical Forest, was carried out with the Cimes and using a different way of organizing them, but uh, they were taken from the exhibition that we had last year, which was called the Goya experience, as I said. And then last January, in terms of uh, sustainability in museums, what I mean by that is what do we use and what's the footprint that we leave for society? Bruno Givaud organized an international workshop uh, which uh, was very popular on this question. And so you can see that here, words are transformed into actions. And we're prière de toucher, pray, touch. So it's the opposite of being forbidden to touch. So the idea is that everyone should be able to touch. So people who have uh, problems with their sight should be able to touch the works of art. And uh, for anybody who is disabled will be able to come and visit in the same way as they can go to the opera uh, for people who can't hear or see. Uh, the idea is that the exhibition should be open to everyone, people who have handicaps and people who don't. And so that's what we wanted to make progress on. We wanted to work on ecology in all fields, as we've been doing in 20 years, in terms of mobility, in terms of housing, nature in the city, but also culture, because culture in Lille is the heart of our policy, because we think that culture is what, up to other people, it enables us also to discover new things, major issues that artists, more than anyone else, and sometimes earlier than anyone else, can enable us to discover. And with this new utopia season, you've probably heard that we were the European capital of culture in 20, 2004, and we didn't only want to keep the abused because at the time we transformed the Saint Sauveur station, where you'll be going later on to see an exhibition, we transformed uh, this station into a cultural venue. It used to be a station, and we've also transformed it and the textile industry as well uh, in underprivileged neighborhoods, and they're areas where people can feel at ease and work with local artists, cultural associations and charities, but also by welcoming international artists as well. And they all work very closely with um, all of the people who live in these neighborhoods. We developed this idea that culture should be at the heart of everything, and it should therefore, and it should reach out and have an impact on everyone. After 2004, we kept the buildings, but we also decided that every three years we would have a season of a few months in the city and in the metropolitan area, and we would choose a theme, and the idea each time sure would have an impact on our society. And I think that today it's quite clear that. Uh, the ecological transition, which for us can't be carried out without a social policy because we'll never manage to reduce our greenhouse gases and our footprint if 
everyone isn't involved by leaving people along the side of the way because there will be some people who have more difficulties and who are more fragile, especially during this period where the problem of buying power with the increase in energy prices has become a problem for everyone. And so we really do have to try and bring everyone on board for this ecological transition. And so we decided to hold a season this year. You'll see two exhibitions. Uh, out of the 30 that were organized. So you'll see in the town yesterday evening from Helsinki, and we have an artist uh, from Finland who uh, made the moss people for us. They're sort of elves uh, who've come out of the forest. I don't know if you've seen them around town. They're covered in moss. And uh, they're all carrying things uh, uh, that we should leave in society. And so we're very, very happy to have this type of metamorphosis in this major avenue, and you'll see later on. But it's a very soft change with all of these nice moss characters. So this year, we decided to call our session Utopia. The idea was to refer to René Dumont, who first of all was an ecologist, but also a professor. And in 1973, or we're all going to die. And so Utopia, or death, and we chose Utopia. And as part of these exhibitions during this season, not by trying to make people feel guilty or dramatizing in any way, because you'll see that uh, you haven't got the Amazon forest burning on every street corner, but we're trying to reach out to people via poetry, the beauty of nature, and by showing them as well why we need not only to preserve nature, but also exhibitions. You'll see two. And uh, you'll be looking at what we call Les Vivants, so living beings. It's uh, organized by the Cartier Foundation. And it shows a call to humankind. Uh, and via their paintings or their drawings, they have paid homage to nature. And it's very poetic, but it's also very strong and powerful. And I think that for a lot of you, you'll leave the exhibition saying to yourselves, and this is what some of uh, I will look at trees and nature in a different way now that I've seen this exhibition. And that's what we wanted to do. That's what we have been aiming for. Just a few words on an inclusive culture. We prepared a charter, as I said earlier on, which uh, we'd already worked on, worked on with our twin towns, and I would like to welcome them and thank them for the work they've done with us. The idea is that in Lille, this charter should be used Secretary General and the President. We've been talking about the fact that we should be able to sign a charter for low carbon inclusive culture that we're going to be showing to the Commission and saying in Europe, all of the cities are mobilized and they're working on these subjects and hope that you're all going to be able to come on board with us with this charter and uh, provide us with your contributions as well so that we can learn from what you have to offer. Now in leave of that, so early in the morning, but I'd just like to say that the design of our buildings and the renovation of all of our buildings, like the saint Sauveur station that you're going to be saying, the Natural History Museum, or even here in the Palais des Beaux-Arts, the idea is that we should always aim to reduce our energy consumption. And just to give you uh, an example with regards to the lights on stage for all of the theatres in the town, because in order to reduce our carbon footprint, you have to act on all levels, from the smallest to the most important, and that's what we're trying to do. And so in the same way, as I was saying for mobility, if we have exhibitions that don't remain in a very limited area around us, but what we'd like to do is to reduce the number of works, but improve maybe the quality and the aim is to enable people to come without using uh, air transport. We're working on our purchasing. We have clauses as well, which enable us to buy locally as a priority that we said for all of the sets that we use. Uh, they retrieve sets and costumes. It's true for museums, true for operas. And in 2021, the opera gave 30 tons on the circular economy in an intelligent way and another way of reusing all of these sets and costumes. And we've created an eco-events guide. You know that we like celebrating here, we like partying, and all of these festivities that are organized by the inhabitants with cultural associations for the last three years have to follow a charter for all of the event charters, so no plastic uh, goblets. We have got to uh, recycle our plastics. 
work on the circular economy, mobility to go to the event has got to be as soft as possible as well. And so as far as that's concerned, uh, we're going to go a step further. Using a, a test that was carried out by the RNF Contemporary Music um, scene, and they system which is called Aero Easy Go, and it tells the audience, uh, or it asks the audience, you know, where have you come from? Where are you going? And on its website, uh, they suggest that people can come either by car sharing or another form of mobility. And so we would like all of the facilities and venues in the to work on this with their audiences so that will people start thinking about the way in which they travel. The last point, because I don't want to go on for any longer, We've started to have a good way of analyzing our carbon footprint. We have carried out a carbon footprint analysis for the two exhibitions that I mentioned, and we're going to do exactly the same thing for our forum as well. So we've started to have a good methodology in order to do this, so both for our carbon footprint, so the sustainability of all of the materials that we including the way in which we build new buildings. We're going to be generalizing this to all answer because I still haven't understood how we can reduce our energy consumption, as I understood uh, only late on that our emails, etc., uh, can use a lot of energy, but I don't see how we can reduce it. So Marie-Pierre is going to explain this because the museum yet again has been for anybody on the sidelines for us. Artistic and educational, or artistic and cultural education is a priority for our children. We've got a 50 is artistic and cultural education so that children will be able to play music, uh, uh, do drama, dancing, be interested in uh, heritage, science. And we really are very proud to see that even in our underprivileged neighborhoods, we've got more and more children who choose to play a musical instrument or choose to do drama or learn to read while they're having fun at the same time. And uh, so they will maybe have more success. We have a policy as well with regards to people who are disabled uh, for uh, senior citizens as well. I'll let you read the document so that you can see the details. I'm going to stop there for the moment. I'd just like to say that we will be very attentive to everything that you're going to be offering us over these two days. Now, you. That gentleman can't hear that he's speaking loudly over there. Now, we will be launching what we call the call to action for Lille. The idea is that we should be able to take action together, take inspiration from each other, and make sure that in Europe uh, we are the pillars, the spearhead, thanks to Eurocity, of a form of culture which is going to be low carbon, more inclusive, working together over the next two days. Thank you very much. Madame, uh, Mrs. Anne-Catherine Pledge, the Deputy Mayor of Dresden and the Vice President of Eurocity and for the Forum Culture. Aubrey, thank you very much for this inspiring and fascinating speeches about your city. Dear colleagues and membership, members of the Eurocities Culture Forum, welcome to our meeting in Lille. Thank you to the representatives of host city and metropole region. I would like to thank to the city of Lille for the hospitality. Thank you for welcoming us in your city, especially to you, Metro City's Brussels office, Julie Ove, and her colleagues for organizing this meeting. Dear colleagues, I'm happy to welcome you for our culture forum in Lille, and it's a pleasure to meet all of you personally. Our team was very different from what we expected. We currently live in times of crisis, the war in Europe, in Ukraine, the pandemic, the political solution. But in times of crisis, we need a strong network like Eurocities. And the colleagues, the last time we met was in Lisboa three years ago. After that great and inspired meeting, we were overrun by the pandemic. And in the last two years, we couldn't have a uh, one-side culture forum. 
But Culture Forum have had many online meetings, online activities. And last but not least, and I have to thank to you all who participated on this lot of online meetings. When we started as chair was one of our priorities to speak about sustainability and, and influencing the mindset of citizens at administrations in our cities. That's the metropole of Lille with the suggestion to our um, to focus on sustainability on this meeting, city to building our future. But before we start in our culture forum, we want to welcome some cities we which have recently joined the Eurocities network, Montpellier, Rheims, Grand Paris Sud, Saint-Denis, uh, Cotic, Gima Verdas. Furthermore, we welcome the cities that participate in the forum for the first time. A very warm welcome, convinced that we experience a diverse, interesting program in Lille in the next days. And I wish us inspiring exchange. Thank you. Merci. La présence, j'appelle Madame. Thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Gazella Marisco, the head of the cre uh, program for uh, creativity and energy transition at Judy's Bit Cycle. Judy's Bit Cycle. Oh, bicycle, sorry. Slides. I don't know if we're going to still use them. Yeah. Oh, oh, OK. Um, can I? change them or shall I say, because I'm trying to go cover quite a lot in a very short period of, is it possible? Yeah, I start saying thank you very much for the invitation. I'm delighted to be here in Lille. Um, I tell you something about Lille. Uh, one year and a half ago, I hope, I don't know if Etienne Bonnet is here from the music. Good. <laughs> 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 Well, one, year, one and a half year ago, um, he said, oh, uh, we were in the middle of the lockdown. So he said, I would love to have a... Com okay. <laughs> um, what other museums are doing, benchmarking, based on all your experience uh, working with museums? And I said, yes, fantastic. So we had a, we had a long and deep conversation, uh, I think one hour, and he said, oh, I didn't know we could go so deep in all this. And I'm really that delighted, really, one year and a half ago, that it's not that much time, and it was virtual time and, and very difficult times. There's been so much progress, really, in all the work that the museum is doing. And we, we, we are really, and, and um, I'm, I was at the Guggenheim last week, and they said, oh, you're going to Lille. They are doing great work. They are leading all this work in France. So it's, it's all spreading. And I think all this spreading is a little bit about what I want to talk about today. But for the ones that don't know us, how do I use this? Uh, just this? No. Which one? Thank you. Yeah, for the, for the ones that don't know us, Julie's Bicycle is a non-for-profit organization. We were founded 15 years ago in London, coming from the music set, catalyzed the green creative economy. So over the last decade, JB has expanded beyond music and into performing visual arts and museums, blending cultural and scientific knowledge to discover how to redesign arts and culture to serve the planet. Those are a little bit the frameworks we use, zero carbon, restore nature, inspire public action, champion climate justice. I'm not doing this well. And leadership into design and innovation, collaboration and policy changing, and creating all these networks. We are not short of frameworks, and I'm not going to focus on this. We have the sustainable development goals. We have the Green New Deal for Europe. Uh, we are working also with new concepts as um, 
the donut economy. So this, this is a, an amazing piece of work in the city of, of, of Amsterdam. And, I, and we are, many of you probably know us because we created this carbon footprint, especially for the cultural sector. Uh, now, these days, we have a lot of demand of adapting uh, the calculators for a specific cultural industries as well as for countries. So we are now working, for instance, in Canada, creating a, a calculator for them. We are having a pilot in Germany. We are in a lot of conversations with a lot of European countries in terms of how to implement and make, make the, the carbon footprint is always probably the driest part, really, the, all the data collection, and, and we, we want to make it as easy as an, as an entertaining as possible. And, and so I was amazed to see all, all the work of Ethiopia, and I wanted to have this in, in the back action. So, um, uh, and this is why the arts and culture have much more to offer than reducing the carbon footprint, and can also bring creativity community and refocusing on values that restore our understanding of belonging within nature and the need to strengthen networks like this one uh, that are based on resilience in this ecological transition that we need to accelerate. I've been in this field in environmental policy, policy for 30 years. At the very beginning, it's all about mainstreaming, ISO, environmental management. But we got to the point now where we really need to accelerate that. And creativity is context-driven. Even. So, the, and the systemic causes of climate change, we focus on the relationships of everybody in the ecosystem, artists, cultural organizations, city government, national government, and all the international um, agenda as well. It's very positive that today, 200 ministers of culture are meeting in Mexico, supported by the UNESCO, to discuss sustainable development. And I have to say, it's the first time they are going to come and consider the climate agenda into all these negotiations. It was also very positive to see in the news this morning that the uh, Minister of Culture in France said that it's going to increase the budget for culture. And this is going to also increase uh, the work in the area of um, the transition, no, the ecological transition as well. So we, there, there is the, there is a lot of things happen, and a lot of things uh, are, are accelerating. And in our work, some things that we learn is about the one of the most important things and conditions for creativity is open mindedness and the capacity to listen. That's why participation and co-creation is so important. So because for innovation, changes in organizational culture, agency, and leadership in a context of collaboration as well. And now I want to go uh, a little bit. Uh, we are starting doing more and more global work. And the issues around environmental justice are coming very obvious also for us. And we say, well, as an organization, where can we start? Something environmental justice is recognizing that the environmental impacts and climate change impacts are differential, are differential in terms of uh, geography, social background, race, economical background, abilities, uh, and with local neighborhoods, a podcast. This was three years ago, which we call the Color Green Podcast. And we are amplifying a lot of diverse voices around the world and bringing a lot of artists into the climate negotiations as well. This is some of the work uh, we did last year for the negotiations for climate change in Glasgow, and we are doing again in Egypt this year in November. So we are actively working with artists from the north of Africa, and we've done that much around city, culture, and environment. And with the World Cities Cultural Forum, we started looking at examples of cities around the world that were starting to work on these issues, like Lille, that I started much earlier. But uh, uh, we started looking, and we thought, well, this is important, really, to bring all this research together 
and to amplify this voice, because we do a lot of advocacy, as you can see, for culture as well. And some of the conclusions is, well, what can you do in terms of cultural policy? First of all, speak to all your colleagues in, in, envir in, in the environmental sections, no? I started working also during the COVID with the city of Bogota in Colombia, and the first question I asked to the, to the cultural um, team was, do you meet with your colleagues uh, in, in the environmental section, in the urban planning sec section? They said, no, we go for a drink, we, yeah, we meet informally, but we don't really interact with them. And, and from there, a huge amount of really has, has happened in terms we are now putting all together, that's gonna be available only as part of the government of Bogota about how to drive all these uh, environmental issues in cultural policy. So sometimes these just informal and open conversations ca can really start a, a lot of interesting work. We, we talk about collaboration, leadership, um, and a specific area is around cultural funding. Uh, there is a number of um, arts councils that want to require environmental criteria for, for funding. I will put the, the example of arts council conversations of what has worked, what didn't work, and, and what best to do. Um, and I just, I'm, I'm very pleased that uh, somebody from Lujubiana is here because this was an unexpected piece of work for us. Uh, the curator of uh, 27 in Lujubiana uh, called us last year, also still during COVID, and they said, oh, there is some things that uh, they would love to really learn from with all the participating designers. Uh, online training, really virtually, and, and uh, the Biennale is, is still on, really, and it's very, very interesting how through uh, design, architecture, um, reimagining systems and infrastructure, you come from a museum, you can have um, um, incidents in, 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 um, in policy at city level, really and a, a toolkit for sustainable exhibitions, and that's, av that's available for everybody. I'm happy to share. Realizing the enthusiasm and, 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 and making sure that we, we use all, all that energy in a positive way to, to make the network grow. And we've been supporting the city of Manchester now for 10 years in bringing together again climate policy at city level with the cultural sector. And um, so that all the information is available. And that was contagious, so I'm inspirational for them. Now Liverpool wants to come, London is doing this. Another five European cities to, to bring all this, this experience into sea change that was a European process, and seven um, Italian cities uh, adopted that model and that way of, of working. We have a lot of materials around this, really, but it's all based in collaboration, support, how to support policy frameworks and, and engagement. A few last words about the work we did for the uh, COP in Glasgow last year, uh, with the support of British Council, um, we did regional roundtables in all continents around the world, and in, in, in some countries in very, very difficult polit political situation, because we did one in Nigeria, we did one in Indonesia, uh, we did one in Colombia. In Colombia, at that point, it was interesting because the national government wasn't talking to the local government of some, some cities. I think the added value of, of international work and having some independent people promoting this, this type of work, really. So all, all this was preparatory for the, for the Climate Change Convention uh, negotiations, and, and we are still working with, with, with the regions, really. This, this co enough energy and enough activity to have some work in that, in, in that area. And a last word, because people always ask us about our work with Arts Council, that is not, so we are at the point that we can start uh, understanding was custom. So the Arts Council England 
uh, annually distributes around 580 million approximately to the arts and culture if we could help. So we devise a program of training, capacity initiations on, on, on innovation on a specific areas that they felt that they needed that push, inspiration, but also a little bit of a push. And a child had a very, very large carbon footprint, so the largest organizations really, and they, they needed a specific energy program dedicated to them. So it's been three years working with this, quite a lot of technical things. And uh, at the completion of, of this, uh, this is a contract for you, all, all these, and we, um, we issue a report, and, and what also we do an annual event that will be next month in Birmingham. And so this program has run for a decade now, and we've seen around 5% reduction in energy, and which translate into 60 million in, er in energy, really a lot of improved well-being and creative inspiration. And, and also, as I said, then all of a sudden we, we are include environmental system sustainability as a core business strategy. Uh, there is rep governance. I didn't talk about governance, but that's something really central to implement sustainability in organizations representatives that have an environmental remit, that review uh, every quarter what's going on and, 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 and the need of, of change if needed. Um, then um, almost half are trying to finance a, is a whole uh, uh, lab projects, which is the Creative Climate Leadership, um, which is a program of leadership but it's really a systemic in intervention. So we've been doing this for six years now um, in different countries. So it's a one-week residential course that we do with cultural leaders in different countries. But we do a lot of preparatory work to do that, apply for the course, which come from all disciplines and, and from all backgrounds. And then we do a lot of follow-up of the initiatives, and this is why we call it more like a systemic in intervention. It's, it's beyond capacity building. And, and a lot of the policies, like Catalonia, that is, is um, amazing, really. Alumni uh, from this course in Catalonia have been doing amazing work at uh, regional policy level. But we got examples from, from all around the world how the alumni are consolidating this network of, of change around uh, some ca uh, three courses coming for this year. So this, this year is, is all full on. So um, thank you very much. Uh, sorry if I rush um, a little bit on all this. Uh, I don't know if there is time for questions. Um, Chris or Julie, but yeah, after. Oh, after. Okay. 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 Madame Nathalie. Mrs. Nathalie Bondil, who's uh, in charge of uh, the She's the vice chair for the Montreal Museum of Finance and uh, our World Institute in our World Institute in Paris. I'm sorry. So I think that uh, I will switch in French hmm? because I'm also not just from Canada but also from Quebec. So I'm very very cautious about the equity balance for language. I'm going to be speaking very quickly. I apologise for having not seen who she was to start with. Now. I think that we are running after time. Est-ce qu'on peut mettre le PowerPoint? So if we could just put the PowerPoint up on the screen. The idea is to. Bon, voilà, ça y est, je commence à parler. So I'm starting to speak English already. I'm having to switch here. So the idea is to talk about sustainable development, and in English we use the word uh, sustainability but it mean the same thing to both of them because the idea of inclusion is far stronger in English when you say sustainability. 
whereas in French, uh, it's understood as being something that's more linked to the ecology. And so I think it's quite interesting from uh, the lexicon point of view and when we want to work together. Now, being local, quite simply, we have to think with the world, but act where we are locally. So think with the world, act where you are. And so Edouard Glissant, who was uh, from Martinique, a philosopher, so he said you've got to be both global and local that are probably of interest to you today are questions that were raised by scientists very often in the past. And for most of them, in terms of the ecology and sustainability, they call upon knowledge that we don't necessarily already have. And that's the reason why we have to ask ourselves about the differences between two cultures. And this refers to a very famous conference which was given by Charles Percy Snow. He wasn't the first, but he was amongst them, amongst the first people to have mentioned uh, and the fact that they were very separated and the fact that we found it hard uh, to have both levels of knowledge. We find it uh, natural. So it's really important to be able to that scientists are speaking. Other ideas, we talk a lot about artificial intelligence, which, as Mrs. Aubry said earlier on, this uses up a lot of energy. I'm going to talk a lot about emotional intelligence. We have to understand, as Antonio Bendemas, you said, the biologist, that the brain is there for the body. It's used by the body. And so you don't have a thought which is only rational. I apologize for teaching you this, but, you know, I think, therefore I am, is not something that really exists. It's I feel, so I am, that's what Darwin said. So we understand things via lots of studies. There are ways of interpreting things which mean about co-reaction, to use the terms uh, to work at the center of you, so working on tree structures or working on a horizontal level rather than working on a vertical taxonomical level. And so we are looking at our knowledge and our partners in a way which is far more horizontal in terms of the power pyramid. Now, this is a very simple diagram that enables you to understand the difference between exclusion, segregation, integration, and inclusion. And obviously it's inclusion that is of interest to you today. And when we talk about inclusion, there are lots of ways of naming it. And so when you speak in French or whether you speak in English, with these two cultural channels, we're able to underline the differences. Very often we're going to talk about universalism when we're in France, and we'll talk about uh, uh, we want to be as inclusive as possible. We talk about secularism, the things that are debated elsewhere with multiculturalism or diversalism. And uh, in North America, uh, they also talk about multiculturalism, which comes moves on to essentialism. So people who think in an essential and diversive way or a way that divides people, we pull together everything that means that we have a rationale whereby we're going to use the debate. The idea of a debate is to not fight. And if we come back to Edgar Morin, democracy is the organization of complexity but in depth. And so the idea is to not talk to people as if you were in an echo chamber. We're all convinced of what we're saying. But nevertheless, it's people who don't necessarily understand us, other people. And so we have to understand and accept with a lot of humility that understanding others' thoughts is very tiring. And from a biological and intellectual empathy requires a lot of work, a lot of effort. And it that therefore requires a lot of modesty and it requires cultural directory or all of the works that we have in our museums have to be looked at in a 360 degree way. There are so many ways of interpreting them, not just a monologue from experts, but there's a possibility of to actually kidnap all of the experts and all of the audiences because all of this belongs to our shared heritage. So don't just think of a public service, think of being of service to different forms of general publics. And so here which comes from Quebec, 
a landscape artist, but it was displayed in all of our schools to show vulnerable nature because the trees that you can see here have now disappeared. And so it was a way of being able, and it's also available in English, to have a look at an educational platform, which is remarkable. It was launched in 2017. It was a very ambitious project that we had when I was in Montreal, in Montreal. And it enabled us to analyze our shared heritage but not from a point of view of history of art or musicology or from the use of experts. The idea was seen. The idea is that you should always platform, which is exceptional. It's a project that I'm very, very proud of. And it's available in two languages again, and it's available in the Montreal uh, Fine Art Museum, and it has been supported by the Ministry for Education in Quebec. The question of inter-religious dialogue, I work at uh, the Arab World Institute, and it's not an institute for Muslim culture because it's quite interesting. When you're also looking at things through a speaking point of view, very often we talk about uh, Islamic culture or Muslim culture, we have a vision uh, where we're looking at the Arab world, which is different. It's quite interesting because it enables us to Oklonk, who is the president. He was the former Minister for Culture and Education in France. And there's a real desire with him to be able to begin interfaith dialogue. And the example that we can share with you here shows you a toolkit, which is for teachers, so that they can talk about uh, Muslim and Jewish culture, and all of this is organized with the Jewish Art Museum in Paris. An example of how complex it is to think as if you were someone else. Uh, if we come back to 2015 with uh, the terrorist attacks, a lot of emotion in Montreal, and the desire to do something as well, and to show our solidarity towards uh, the people who had suffered from these terrorist attacks in France. And so we asked ourselves the question, we said, we're in Quebec, a French-speaking nation, very sensitive to, and in Canada, the idea of je suis Charlie, I'm Charlie, is something that we fight for because we're in a different way of looking at things where we're far more like the United States, in God we trust, where we don't necessarily understand secularism in the same way. So when you're in Quebec, representing the prophet is something that people can understand when you're in Alberta, which is another province in Canada, it's considered as being blasphemous. So how are we going to bring everyone together? How are we going to be able to design a shared destiny? And so the idea was to work uh, in very a lot of detail to take a poem from Eluard to say, freedom, I'm going to draw your name. So it's not freedom, I write your name. Freedom, I'm going to draw your name. And drawing in the name of freedom, and with a lot of displays, posters in all schools, and lots of leaves, but there should be no self-censorship. Another intercultural question and interfaith question is organized at uh, the Fine Art Museum in Montreal with an artist who came from what we call the First Nations, so uh, a local native artist who was dressed with uh, clothes by Jean-Paul Gartier, accused of uh, intercultural appropriation. And uh, so both uh, the modern artist and also Jean-Paul Gautier, they're very, very much involved in LGBT causes. And so to go beyond this issue of uh, accusing somebody of taking on somebody else's culture, and this is what Jean-Paul Gaultier didn't understand, because in France it's something that we don't understand at all with regards to native uh, cultures. And so he decided to have a wedding, a little bit like an artistic performance, which was displayed in the Canadian Embassy. Same thing, promoting diversity of gender to lot in Canada as participants of gay pride uh, uh, with uh, we've been working on gay pride for a very long time uh, with uh, educational organizations as well and i'd invite you to go to the arab world institute where you have an exhibition with regards to uh, sexual minorities and gender in just a second what do you see on this photo can anyone see anything what do you see a dog okay somebody said a dog Pour les personnes qui n'avaient pas For the people who hadn't seen the dog before we said it, now that we've said it, you can no longer not see that animal on the photo. Your memory, with your emotions, with your cognitive capabilities, 
it all gives you an instrument which activates our brain is a survival organ and it's a machine for storytelling. It's always inventing scenarios so that we can understand the world that surrounds us because this chaos is far too complex for our brain. And via all of this bias in cognition, we have to think of what we're going to understand parts of work by seeing what is invisible. And here you've got a photo by Jane, Julie Moose, who's a Canadian artist. And uh, here, so it's a bit like Jean-François actually saw it until another expert uh, showed me that there was a young slave there that we can see thanks to the fact that he's wearing a necklace. Now, for those of us who are also from different generations so that we can try and avoid these generation gaps. We also find ourselves confronted with two Montreal who were interested in the collections in the museum and who had also created works as well on the basis of that. And so the idea is to multiply all of our perspectives. We've also created lots of different committees because the cultural institutions can use different committees, a green one, for example, uh, an art and health committee, but also committees on, with regards to how we can live together that we've created with the city of Montreal. And the president uh, was the president of the Montreal City Council, who helped us so that we could work on all of these intercultural questions. And so yet again, it's not one flag for one people, it's uh, federate all those um, ideas. We talk a lot about care and the culture of care and empathy at the moment. We're going to go from care to cure, and cure is how we can repair. Uh, the need for beauty is absolutely aesthetic emotions, and that's what you can see here with this bird. Uh, it uh, doesn't seem that impressive, but uh, he builds wonderful things with twigs, with all sorts of colorful accessories. And if you say beauty, you're talking about our health because it's something that really is deep down in our reptilian brain. As far as inclusion is concerned, we also talk about health and public health. And all of these approaches which are linked to, to therapy, therapy, have all of our brain cells that are working in terms of empathy, all of our mirror brain cells which are working and it will enable you to feel good, make you feel good. It's fantastic, isn't it? Makes us laugh. So as I said, it makes you feel good and it therefore generates and creates more hormones. Now I'm going to go through this very quickly because, but it's very serious because I work a lot on these questions of mesotherapy with a neuro physiologists and scientists with the University of Montreal. And this is an example that was in the Fine Art Museum in Orléans. And in Lille, there are lots of activities as well. Contemplating works of art, you're going to be creating uh, endorphins which will make you feel so good. This is something that you can do in your towns and cities as well. We did it in Montreal. In 2018, uh, you could go to your doctor and he would give you a uh, prescription to go to a museum and 18. Since then, Geneva has followed us, Brussels has followed us, and so I hope that Lille and all of you are going to do this as well. So this is something that has been about a culture of serendipity, the fact that uh, you can be creative active, that uh, you can leave a little bit of a space for your imagination and making mistakes. You never make a mistake, really. Uh, we're always in a laboratory of ideas. We're trying to open up to new fields. And as Auguste Rodin said, who used all of or who made all of these little parts uh, so that he could create new works and masterpieces, he had the same approach. And it's so important to think of civil society. You're all members with your cultural organizations and citizens. An example here is an extraordinary one. In 2009, with Yoko Ono, who came to Montreal, had, uh, with John Lennon for Queen Elizabeth, the f fight against uh, the war in Vietnam. And it was a project uh, which should have been free. And I worked with Yoko Ono. And uh, we wanted to give the, the city a gift to the Fine Art Museum said, well, maybe you're going to have to sell tickets because otherwise you're going to have to reduce. I've worked a lot. And we said, OK, let's work by exchanging services. That's so important. We'll exchange services. And it worked so well to be able to include partners from all over the city that we brought together over 40 sponsors and partners. It wasn't a question of money. It was a question of being able to offer services so that uh, we could look for the art, share the graphics, the advertising, the painting, transport, etc. And we even 
even had an uh, underground system who recorded Yoko Ono, who said every day for three months, uh, uh, you know, she said, peace is love, etc. And all of the citizens in the town were able to participate. And that was absolutely fantastic. It's the strength of co-creation. It's almost as if we'd had $1.4 million, thanks to the participation of all of these different people. I'm going to conclude with two documents that you can find online. The first one is the Health Evidence Network Synthesis Report from the World Health Organization. And it's a meta-analysis of all in Europe uh, with regards to health. So we're saying that art can heal, and you'll be able to look at that study. And then another one that I worked on a lot, I participated in and local development, maximizing the impact and how museums can help your community, civil society to grow so that we can in participate in. À présent, la now we've got the political roundtable with the introduction with Mr. André Sobchak, the General Secretary for Eurocities. Vice Mayors, uh, dear city representatives, uh, it's a great pleasure for me as uh, Eurocity Secretary General to uh, welcome you and to see you all here in Lille for this cultural forum. Uh, before having been appointed Secretary General of Eurocities, uh, I have been working with our network for eight years, and I've always considered that uh, the forum meetings are actually one of our most important activity because it's during these forum meetings uh, that uh, we uh, learn from each other, we have a trust relationship, learn from uh, not so good experience sometimes in our cities. It's also a way to discover a lot of initiatives uh, in the different cities, and it's uh, an opportunity also to create common projects, and this is also what we are doing. And I really would like to thank uh, uh, Madame Le Maire, uh, Martin Aubry, uh, and the team from the city of Lille and the metropolitan area uh, of course, also uh, the chair of the Cultural Forum, uh, Mrs. Klebsch, and uh, the team from Eurocities for having set up such an exciting program over the two days. Uh, I know that it's a lot of work uh, to prepare everything, but it's worth it, and we have been waiting for three years, actually, to meet again and uh, to see also some new faces and to have a lot of uh, opportunities to discuss, to mingle over the different breaks during the different... Uh, so actually, the first forum meeting I'm attending as, as Secretary General is a cultural forum. Uh, maybe it's not the forum that I have known. Uh, we have been missing not only uh, meetings of our networks, but we have also been missing culture over the last years. And uh, yesterday evening, for example, during the discussions over dinner, we have uh, discussed the fact that uh, in our cities we had a lot of cultural institutions that have been closed down uh, by the net. If mayors ruled the world, maybe uh, a lot of mayors ruled the world, maybe uh, a lot of these cultural activities would not have been closed down because actually as mayors or vice mayors, you know that this cultural activity, the importance of uh, culture, not only for creativity, but also because they can uh, have a huge impact on our health and in our relationships. And it's uh, very important that uh, the focus of this forum uh, is on sustainable culture. And uh, again, I think it's very interesting to have a subject because I have always considered that uh, we need to change a lot of things in our cities uh, in order to become more inclusive and uh, saying and also to uh, give a positive person coming here for this forum shows that actually it's uh, something that is very important. It's very much in line with, of course, uh, priorities of Euro cities. Uh, we uh, want to work together to have better lives uh, and uh, clean environment for all our citizens and culture can contribute to this. We are really convinced about it and uh, we have shown already uh, since this morning a lot of examples uh, going on in this field and it's also something that is more and more aligned with the EU policies and uh, we have seen that the European Commission now 
integrates also the sustainability uh, dimension in all their policies, including also the policy. So I think there's also a representative of the European Commission here. And so I really would like also to thank the Commission for the very good work that we can do together in this field. And I'm sure that uh, also during so we will have actually two political roundtables uh, this morning. Uh, first one more on the ecological dimension of uh, cultural activities and the second one more on the social dimension on the inclusion. So I would like to ask the representative of the different cities on the ecological dimension, um, the vice mayor of Ljubljana, the vice mayor of Tampere, of Reims and Leeds. Please join me here on the floor. Take a seat. So uh, we'll talk a lot about a project that is British, but you are actually going to talk about the Warehouse Decibel Fest Festival, which is a very interesting festival where you... Uh, I'm going to talk about is a little bit in between culture, a part of the culture of a city. So uh, listen to the rock musics. So we thought that was a good idea to take these this stage, a waste disposal plant that we have in outside the city that has a beautiful park around. So we put together three things that, that can, uh, how do you say, make culture of, uh, of CO2 in atmosphere. The first one is that the, the, all the energy needed for that concert and all the activities that in this big stage uh, will be held during the year is given directly by the power plant that makes that energy from the, from the waste burning. So it's actually green energy that comes into, so we don't use the energy made in other, in other uh, power plants. The second one is that the young kids that come in that place start inside that, that uh, um, industrial uh, building that seen from away it looks like hell, but it's not hell. It's something that where you can make something very good for like to drink. Of course, we want also to keep the, uh, the... So we thought that maybe a solution could be this. This is a plastic glass. But it's only one for one kid because it has a QR code in the back. So if with the phone, everyone has a phone in a concert, they take the QR code, they, they have not only the, um, the schedule of all the year uh, events in that place, but they also have, they can order drinks, they can offer drinks to others. It becomes something that you keep, keep with you all your, not your life along, but for many years, for many months. So they, we, esti we made an estimate that they save 82 kilograms of plastic not used. That is a big number. And also the, um, the saving of energy uh, taking it from the plant was a, a very big number. Now we are thinking, following what the Secretary General said before, my city made an end, a, a history of culture to take the organization of the museums on, under the administration. Because we have the skill to do that, and we have the need to do that, because uh, sharing culture with everybody. So in that moment, the, 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 the government will give us the the controlling of all the, the museums in Arezzo, all the energy that gives light and heat to the museums will be uh, used by that power plant. So we're making a big program. program. We are at the beginning, but I think it works pretty, pretty good. Thank you very much Thank for you. this testimonial. And a very concrete uh, commitment. Uh, so uh, I will pass uh, the, the floor to uh, Anne Catherine Klebsch, uh, the chair of our cultural forum. And uh, you have also a good experience in uh, Dresden about uh, uh, developing a charter for culture for future. And uh, maybe you can create then also a link for this new call for action that we are doing here in Lille as well, and to see how actually our cultural forum. In we believe that uh, we need strategies in our cities to develop the uh, Europe and European Union also from, from bottom up. And 
Um, one idea from our um, cultural st strategy process um, on the last five years um, was the topic sustainability for um, uh, cultural institutions. And uh, so we started two years ago now um, a process with um, five uh, pilot uh, projects, uh, five um, institutions from different uh, library um, and a festival. And uh, we got some money from the um, uh, an agency to moderate a process with uh, these institutions. And um, in, in the end, they um, wrote uh, this um, Culture for Future declaration. Um, and in January of this year, we um, um, show it to a lot of... Um, we, um, we started in uh, this year that um, 37 uh, culture organizations from the... Um, from the uh, city and from the uh, free state of Saxony and from um, a private together. And um, it helps us uh, to bring more collaboration, um, um, improved uh, to more collaboration um, between the uh, different departments of the administration of the city, between um, the um, um, Klimaschutzstab, Sustainability, bo main board of our city, and uh, between... ...important, of course, to involve all the different local stakeholders, and uh, your example shows that cities really have an important role also in bringing the culture. So, thanks a lot. We will now move to Ljubljana. <laughs> And Ljubljana, you have been uh, from the XCOM of Euro cities, of course. And uh, how do you uh, develop this sustainability policy in the cultural sector? Thank you very much. First, I would like to say that uh, we are very honored to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Um, <coughs> of course, uh, the green capital of Europe is the highest reward uh, one city can get in Europe. We think we have to fulfill. 11 very strong criteria about this, uh, about uh, maintaining the water, the waste, the areas, uh, also the culture to be sustainable city. Uh, let's, uh, for the example, uh, we close the city center for the traffic. We gain 120,000 uh, square meters for the pedestrian and also to use our parks in, uh, in the city. So we develop one program. It's called like a, a library under the treetops. It means that we put some uh, some books there, so the people can come and uh, they uh, can um, in peace in the in the city center read books and get to know which some other some uh, authors there. Uh, also, we put in that parks a water fountain, which means that they can also drink the water there if they're thirsty. And uh, we uh, made some programs for tourists to tell them that we have this program in Ljubljana so they can come to read in Ljubljana and lower emission what we have before. And uh, we are talking about Bionometer is calling, which is um, a cultural monument, but it's measuring uh, different of blueness of the sky and also gathering some uh, data about the pollution of the sky and this cyanometer was established in that time 2016 but 2017 it was the second one in looking what is going on in Roslo and vice versa so we are connected also um, we can speak about this for three days not for three minutes mm -hmm. uh, but I saw from uh, previous panel that uh, the, the, the time in culture is no pressure, so <laughs> maybe just one minute, uh, because we said really some uh, good uh, project it was uh, we have a sink, the plants, they are already maybe expiring, or maybe from the, from the stores they don't need any more. They are growing there, of course, further on, but also for some uh, exhibition we have there. So people can come. We put the, the sustainability also in our cultural buildings. Uh, we are now um, 
arena will have the green roof and the solar panels, and where there was a, a factory yard, now it will be a beauty, be beautiful, beautiful park, uh, culture in Ljubljana, and so high level. Uh, and they recognized this also this year as a, um, the destiny of, this year was announced as the best green capital this year from the capital. So, mm. and I must say maybe just one word that the name Ljubljana, comes from the names, the word beloved. So it means it's a city of love. Right? Mm. And uh, uh, it also has the love for the culture. The culture was the basic that we get on own country, on own capital, uh, because uh, as you know, the Slovenian uh, nation was all the time in history in other uh, other states, not own. So the, we are very, very uh, connected with the with the culture and spreading all, all the all. And actually, Ljubljana, as many cities are beloved cities, uh, and uh, and sustainability come together. Uh, let's move to Tampere and uh, the deputy mayor for culture and education, uh, Mattia Helimo. You are going to talk about a very interesting concept. I find. Uh, Thank you, thank you very much, and as well, I want to thank the city of Lille, very beautiful city, to holding the the forum for us. So, a couple of words of, of of raising how we raise environmental awareness through culture in Finland and in Tampere. The city slogan of Tampere is, is the Tampere, the city of action. So we always want to act, and I like to. As the mayor said in the beginning, there are big things that you can do and small things you can do. I'm going to pick up two small our CO emissions in everyday work. But at the same time, we want to affect the world around us and encourage people to make sustainable choices in their own lives. Our goal as a, as a city is to be carbon neutral in year 2030. And how we small things that we can do about it. Public-owned uh, cultural institutions in Tampere, they reach the audience of almost two million people every year. So it, we ha it has a huge influence. Uh, we should take advantage of that as well. Uh, culture, as we know all, affects us on an emotional level, helps us understand the world and uh, around us, and in it increases the empathy. empathy as we talked yesterday. Uh, for this reason, we have chosen environmental awareness as the main theme in our various cultural institutions. So one example, we had a, a unique Mumi Museum in Tampere, and it presented an illustration exhibition about children's stories that take place on a sea. Along with the art, children took part and the, and the families. Another good example would be our Philharmonic Orchestra, who played a symphony for insects. And actually, the concert hall is the biggest in Scandinavia and carbon neutral, by the way. But the concert was accompanied by a fun insect information package for families, made by our Natural History Museum. Uh, and these are just two small examples how we have combined art and environmental awareness, of course. The education system of Finland plays a huge role in, in this, this as well. And art has been the driving force, part of the solution once again. And as a city and a cultural workers, we have a voice, and it's very important that we use it. Thanks. To, for the art and uh, heritage in Reims. So thank you very much for coming and talking to us about how you work on the fact that your museums are becoming more green and how you're uh, having uh, temporary gardens so that you can welcome as many people as possible and how you're involving. Dear colleagues, I'd just like to say how I'm delighted that Reims is participating in the EuroCities Cultural Forum. And with Reims, a quick presentation maybe because we're new to this uh, forum. We're at 45 minutes away from Paris. It's a city which is a very rich past and history, the, the crowning of, of French kings and its cathedral that was part of the French and German conciliation and its art deco you've all heard of and probably know as well. But uh, we're not going to just uh, 
base what we're doing on our history. We'd like to move towards the future with technologies and bioeconomy. And uh, we use our young people a lot. We have 35,000 students in Reims, uh, the first campus outside Paris for Sion. And we've developed a very important form of culture. It's 15% of our town budget. And like Lille, we have carried out a cultural diagnosis with a document for development and we have a project for artistic development and yesterday as part of our actions we were given percent ESC which uh, is uh, we're very proud of in Reims. We've also developed a sustainable culture. Before we asked other people, the city has got to be exemplary. We can't ask it of others if we're not ourselves. And so in our establishments, we've put into place ac actions for sustainable development. And here you can see energy. I'm also thinking about soft mobility festivals where we paid attention to, to regards to our exhibitions. This year, in all of our museums, we developed a theme which was that museums are becoming green with various exhibitions and events, conferences, etc. In our museums or outside our museums so we can be as close to the general public as possible. And uh, if I take one example that concerned water, which uh, started in spring, it was a theme which became even more important this summer given the weather conditions we had uh, and it was uh, art and me in water even if it shows us that the city like all cultural stakeholders has to whether it be big organizations in what we call the CPOs, but also smaller organizations as well. We have reviewed our criteria for subsidies. First of all, we have included two main new ones. One that concerns inclusion. So from now on, uh, for subsidies, all projects must think about people with disabilities, people who uh, can't see, can't hear, and uh, we can't have any cultural projects that won't include everyone. And we also have to have criteria that are linked to sustainable development as well. That's brand new because I've received, I saw some of the uh, social transport and if there are any tours, it's all got to be part of local artists rather than people who are coming. Uh, when we talk about energy, it's got to be clean energy, uh, producing all of our sets and costumes as well because sets are often built without a form of eco-design, without thinking about recycling. And so criteria for subsidies and also purchasing and local produce, that was mentioned earlier on, we always have to think about a circular economy as well because far too much paper finds itself uh, in our streets. We use far too much paper at all of our events. I also wanted to say that uh, Things went very well because the third part that we're putting into place concerns uh, talking positively, speaking positively, because we're always saying that uh, an ecological tra transition and sustainable development has a cost. But what we always like to say is that, first of all, it's an investment. And so here we have just moved a festival towards uh, electrical uh, charge points, whereas before they used to use generators. and. Uh, the savings that were going to made people made people automatically realized and uh, they realized that they were going to reduce their spending and it's virtuous because once you've forced people to use uh, so involving all of the cultural actors and always have that positive way of talking about sustainable development This uh, first round table is from Leeds, uh, Council at Lessica Lennox. You are going to talk about how uh, actually the 20 It's to be here and fantastic to hear so much, uh, so many ideas from different places. So I'm going to give you a broad overview of Leeds' experiences and challenges um, regarding sustainable, developing sustainable culture in our city. Um, there are three main areas that our strategy includes, and that's buildings and energy, um, travel and transport, and then a, a, an overview of, of the focus on ecological sustainability. So in Leeds, our definition of culture is what we do and who we are, encompassing a broad range of actions and place and its people 
a unique and distinctive identity. So that covers, I think we've made sure that covers everything that could possibly <laughs> need to cover. Um, March 2019, Leeds City Council passed a motion to declare a climate emergency in the city and also signed up to a science-based carbon reduction target, which was consistent with achieving the um, aims of the Paris Agreement. Um, this resolution included working towards making Leeds carbon neutral by 2030, and this includes um, our culture and creative organisations in our city who've responded really positively, um, and we are actively working together um, towards this. So part of this work has been to d develop um, a roadmap to carbon neutrality, and this has been led by an organisation called SAIL, which was referenced earlier on in one of the presentations, which stands for Sustainable Arts in Leeds, and that's for our cultural and creative industries. And their roadmap focuses on buildings and energy, water, waste, travel, natural capital, and community. Um, significant improvements have already been made to our public buildings across the city as part of our um, wide-scale public sector decarbonisation projects. And it's anticipated that by the end of phase two, um, we will have invested £50 million uh, into decarbonising our buildings. Um, a significant number of buildings, including our art gallery, um, Leeds Art Gallery, our city museum and our town hall, have been connected to the Leeds Pipes Network, which is our district heating network, which uses heat produced at our um, incinerator, the Leeds Recycling and Energy Recovery Facility, then heats our buildings. And other buildings have benefited from air and ground source heat pumps um, and solar energy, for example, the Opera North building, um, alongside other improvements to building management, um, upgrades to LED lighting and other similar things. And this has required substantial capital investment, which has been secured from central government and also from other sources more locally. And the main challenges have been around adapting our old buildings. Um, regarding our travel and transport, the wider city focuses on delivering a low carbon but affordable transport network. Unfortunately, in um, one day, um, this encourages people to be physically active um, and reduce reliance on the private car, so we've invested also in cycling routes in our cities. Recently, our West Yorkshire Combined Authority and our Mayor, uh, Tracy Braben, announced that they were using some funding to ensure that passengers using bus services in the region would pay no, pay no more than £2 per journey, which I can tell you is an improvement on some of the, the prices of the journeys before that. And that was launched um, just two weeks ago. Um, cultural organisations across the city are also beginning to capture uh, travel data from audiences uh, to develop a strategy for more sustainable travel to our, to our venues and our attractions. The pandemic did make that more difficult to progress, but it does continue um, as audiences start to return on biodiversity in our city centre and greening our city centre. Um, this includes closure of roads, um, turning over of roads to pedestrian space, um, development of the largest new city centre park in the UK, which is called Air Park, um, and that will include an event space um, and a playground and a cafe, and that surrounds one of our galleries, the Tetley, which is a contemporary art gallery on the South Bank. Any strategy which for the next 10 years commits to planting 50, 50 hectares of woodland a year, which is around 225,000 trees um, for the life of the strategy and hopefully beyond. And that further extends green spaces into our communities. Um, and other biological improvements that were being made um, are through our planning permission um, systems. So that will ensure that there's at least a 10% biodiversity net gain um, in new developments in our city, which is um, part of the 2021 Environment Act. And these initiatives demonstrate that we the re, the need continue to be made in Leeds across the city to chase that target. Uh, ...with the representatives of uh, Torino. So it's a little bit frustrating, of course, because we have to be quite quick. Uh, but uh, the idea is also, of course, to identify some of the speakers. And then over the coffee breaks and during the visit this afternoon, you can continue, of course, the discussions with the different representatives and learn more. And obviously, uh, you can also right. 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 Okay. <laughs> So we will continue with uh, Bali Annette uh, Christie from Glasgow. Uh, so you will talk about community engagement involving citizens and early stages about sustainability. And for all the speakers, uh, please try to stick at the time limit. Uh, I have now <laughs> possibility because, of course, we are a lot uh, later on with uh, how you involve uh, the citizens in cultural activities. Uh, 
thank you. Um, I'm delighted to be here in Lille, uh, representing Glasgow. Uh, what I want to speak about today is a little bit about cultural heritage or generations. Glasgow's slogan uh, is People Make Glasgow, that's the city brand. So it's very important for us that we meaningfully include our citizens in all our conversations on culture and the development of sustainable uh, future uh, and the policies that will get us there. And it's particularly important that we include three democracy in action. Now, of course, there's three elements to the European cultural heritage strategy for the 21st century. Uh, there's a social component, they're all very important, all three of them, and it's vital that people, place and planet are balanced. Glasgow has an urban development plan that recognises the importance of culture, arts and heritage within the placemaking principle. We know that uh, and it gives us a sense of place, well-being and our cultural identity. Uh, so I wanted to speak to you just a little bit about one of the projects that we've been uh, working on recently and uh, one that's going to follow up on it. So it's the Borough Renaissance Project. And you'll hear a wee bit about more about it tomorrow in the City Showcases 26. Um, so the growth of Glasgow as an international visitor destination can all be traced back to that first step in 1980. Three, but it didn't stop there. The building closed in 2016 so that we could bring it into the 21st century. It's now been developed, redesigned, it's been opened up, there's been new roof, new glazing, um, heating, but 20th century heating is gone so we now have a sustainable future um, with technology that is fit for this century. Um, and in doing all of this, there was consultation with communities. Over 15,000 people, local people, spoke to us about what they thought this museum should be, what it meant to them, and what it should be in the future. It's now used as educational tools within our school <coughs> curriculum. It's opened up kids' eyes to the world of art and culture in a museum setting. And as I said, if I can just finish on this one wee thing, um, <laughs> I can never stop three minutes, it's not long for me. Um, this museum is set in Pollock Country Park. So the next step is, Paul, in Pollock Country Park, there's also is to build a living heritage centre for the future. Again, there's been full consultation. This will also showcase the Clydesdale horses. And I don't know if you know, a very, very famous horse breed. And we will bring the old technology of horsepower, reinvent it to the new technologies of the future, all making it sustainable. It will be open to the public. Oh, sorry, can you not hear? Sorry. Um, so that is ongoing, and within the next few years, we will see horses reintroduced to Pollock Country Park, close by the borough collection. And okay. in doing that, public consultation, we will also involve, as the work progresses, there'll be involvement of social enterprises and local groups. So there'll be training and employability programs. Thank you. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Very interesting uh, approach. Uh, we will move uh, to uh, Mr. Tuchlinski, and uh, you're going to talk about, uh, in particular, how you develop participatory budgeting for cultural activities, which is another way of including the stakeholders. Uh, hello, thank you very much that, uh, that I can be here and present my city and what we do together as uh, uh, local authorities but also with the citizens um, when we talk about the culture and different kind of uh, cult culture investments but also the culture uh, activities. Um, we spent as a city uh, 7 million euros uh, per year all the culture activities without the uh, investment in the culture. And one of the things which we use and which, we, we, which is chosen by the, by the citizen is the, uh, so the uh, non-governmental organization. Uh, they can think about some kind of idea, some kind of project, and it is um, uh, vo the people, citizen vote through the participation budget we do as a uh, as a city because it's uh, uh, it start to be a part of the of the budget uh, but um, uh, in nowadays when we talk about the investments and now we started to think that the culture is also one of the uh, factor which developed 
and uh, can be um, uh, are created by the by the citizens. So I think uh, uh, this is a, a good um, do, good way that not all the projects are creating by the officers from the city hall. That the, the citizens uh, feel that they create the culture uh, um, uh, projects, they, they, they have their own input to the culture in the city. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks <laughs> a lot. I know that it's not <laughs> more time. Thank you. Thanks a lot for, for being short. And it's a good example of empowering the city citizens, actually, in developing these activities. So we are now moving to Birmingham. And you, by the way, will host the next culture of the next event. And you're going to talk about the sustainability <laughs> agenda of the Commonwealth Games that you will host uh, in 2022. Thank you very much. Good. And um, the sustainability and travel issues were very, very important to the planning and delivery of the Games overall. And a lot of effort went into this. And this resulted in um, a carbon impact, which is included on all journey planners, um, some extending the use of labelling going forward. We then had um, some very practical things to do with sports equipment. Um, 16,000 equipment items were distributed after the games were ended. Everything from goalposts to and sporting equipment to drinks carriers. Over 1,500 applications were made over in a week, and these these are assessed and practical. Excuse me, things um, taken on. As far as are we doing okay for time? Yeah, <laughs> almost, almost there. Yeah. Um, as far as non-sporting activities, we had a Commonwealth Games headquarters and the furniture has been paired with local charitable homes. The Athletes Village, it was based very close by to the stadium, has also um, been able to recycle and upcycle various items, um, from formal dress to toiletries, cleaning products, kettles, and even the AstroTurf. Um, I'm just going to speed yeah. through the last couple yeah. of ones. Very green things. We had a Commonwealth Legacy Forest. 87 acres were planted in the first session. A local water company is committed to planting more trees by 2024. 72 tiny forests were planted. Over 2,000 members of the community came and got involved in, in forest planting. And finally, um, we, it's a bit of a cliche, but Birmingham has more... more more, can, more miles of canals than Venice, and 22 miles of that canal were cleared by the Canal and Rivers Trust and volunteers. 500 bags of plastic retrieved, and future volunteering opportunities made available. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, and it shows that even uh, when we organize big events, because sometimes we want to have these big events, we can still integrate sustainability criteria. Uh, let's move to Saskia Lammers from Eindhoven, and uh, you have a very interesting example about uh, how you include actually new people arriving in the city in the cultural activities, and also, uh, you're very famous for your design school, how you involve the artists also in sustainability issues. Well, thank you for inviting us here. Um, for us, culture and design reflect, uh, connect people of all ages and backgrounds, and we, uh, it helps us to imagine worlds which aren't there yet. And uh, for our societal challenges, like sustainability and also social inclusion, it's essential to uh, get the help of our creatives to really solve these problems. Um, to tell you something short about uh, Eindhoven, Eindhoven is a fast-growing city. Uh, currently, we have about 240,000 inhabitants, and um, we have a booming high-tech industry. And this is so uh, booming that uh, they expect that in the next 10 years, we will have 70,000 new inhabitants in our region from all over the world. And of course, that's really nice for our economy, but it also faces uh, uh, a lot of challenges on, for example, on affordable housing, on social uh, cohesion in neighborhoods, and of course, also uh, for our environmental impact. 
But luckily, we have a lot of creators in our city. We have the designs, several design schools, and we uh, really want to make use of their uh, um, uh, creativity. For example, we are one of the cities who even have our own social designers as employees in our city government, which help us to uh, face all the challenges we have in the city. For example, on urban development, we have like a neighborhood which is slightly underprivileged, and we ask uh, designers for, uh, for we are, they are called, uh, to really um, um, uh, empower the neighborhood and involve them in rethinking the future of this neighborhood. How does it look like? How can we improve safety? How can we improve the social cohesion? How can we live together? And that's a very important way to uh, use the cre creativity for the social challenges we have. Um, I don't know how much time I have because I have lots one more minute, good. <laughs> then I will... <laughs> very short, yeah. Um, very short one, is, uh, well, on uh, climate change. We do not only want to impact our own city, but also the rest of the world. And there is, a, for example, a designer which uh, has been on our design school, which, who is called Dave Hawkins, and he has a project about precious uh, plastics. And um, he makes it a kind of a platform a worldwide platform from Africa to the city of Eindhoven um, to rethink what you can do with plastics. And it shares, it's a platform where you share the machines, share the pro uh, product designs, so everybody can in be get involved in this uh, uh, challenge. So we really, um, well, and the creators in our city are uh, always uh, uh, rethinking how to empower more people, more <coughs> different people to our challenges. Thanks, uh, thanks a lot. Uh. Can I say one, <laughs> sen one certain <laughs> sentence? Uh, we just heard, and that's news for today, that as a city we uh, uh, are invited to get one of the 60 craft cities, which is combining the climate neutral challenges with the new Bauhaus initiative. And we are uh, certainly proud of it. And it helps us, and I hope uh, maybe more of you are also part of it, that we can share ideas and experience uh, how to um, face our societal challenges. And thank you. <laughs> Thanks. And congratulations. Uh, let's move to Munich with Marion Lüttig and uh, gender is also an important element of uh, inclusion and cultural activities. So you are going to uh, give some examples about how you make sure that gender is equally involved in cultural activities. Yeah, thank you very much. By the way, these chairs look more comfortable than they actually are. <laughs> and, maybe, and thank you very much for having me or having us here from Munich. And thank you all for still being present here and willing <laughs> to listen. And uh, maybe we need some movement first because I uh, look all the time to all to our two very professionally working interpreters upstairs. So thank you very much for the job you are doing up there. And I'm really impressed. Thank you. But um, Indeed. it's quite interesting, uh, you said it, uh, one of the SDGs uh, focuses on, on gender aspects as well, and that's quite, uh, quite right so, I think, because uh, if you look upon the city of Munich, our goal, of course, is to create conditions for an environmental policy that understands gender justice as an opportunity to improve the equality of policy through more open perspective. And at the same time, we try um, also, as, or look up on it as a responsibility to avoid any policy that discriminates against women and other genders. And therefore, this gender perspective is for us essential in policy development and should be included at all levels. <laughs> And I try to give you two short or quick examples, short is an expression, well, <laughs> examples uh, from our current strategic work we do in Munich. Uh, the Department of Arts and Culture dedicates a position for cultural equality work. What does that mean? This includes the publication of a gender report every three years, the recording and evaluation of gender budgeting, and many other statistics on gender-specific indicators. Included also preventive measures and awareness raising guidelines for a safe and non-discriminating workplace for all genders within the infrastructure of the city's cultural venues. And furthermore, 
Munich has its own cultural funding budget for feminist and LGBTIQ topics, which supports culture projects of independent artists, initiatives, and non-governmental cultural organization. It focuses in particular on networking, the inclusion of different perspectives as, and marginalized groups, as well as cultural projects around, let's say, International Women's Day and, for example, the Lesbian Visibility Day every year. And maybe you've heard of it. Uh, um, we have an, the initiative in Munich called Munich Kiev Queer, which is permanently funded for its pride cooperation, exchange, and joint projects, which have been extended beyond Munich's partner city Kiev to the whole of Ukraine. And as you can imagine, since the outbreak of the war, the main focus has been on help and support for all members of Ukraine's LGBTIQ community. Another great example, you may know the internationally renowned Museum Lindbach House that addresses gender issues through its budget and exhibitions. And quite early on, they have been presenting female artists in large solo exhibitions here and, uh, and explicitly did that so and increased uh, exhibitions of female artworks. And for about four years now, they are part of the international initiative Art Plus Feminism, which sustainably aims to strengthen the visibility of female artists on Wikipedia. It's a sustainability mm. field as well, digitalization. And last but not least, our literature archive, Monat Sensia, I would call it in German, it not only holds the Mann and the Wedekind's family work, but also focuses with its artistic and academic project, Female Heritage, on female art, culture, and history in a digital and very collaborative way that sustains. And you can follow at monosensia underscore MUC, and it's very welcome to do so and share your knowledge using the hashtag Female Heritage. Check that out. Do that. It's really impressive. I could, I, I could go on and on and on, as everybody could. <laughs> yeah. But I can promise you this is only a small snippet of our work we do in Munich. And then ho I hope we can deepen uh, the one or the other aspect in conversations afterwards. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. And uh, we will have actually uh, still more time afterwards during the breaks and the other sessions to pursue these different uh, discussions and to uh, get inspired from all these examples. Uh, now let's move to Gima Resch. Uh, uh, hello. Good morning, everyone. And uh, it's our first time here in the Eurocities Culture Forum. So on, I want to thank to all the Eurocities team and also to the city of Lille for all the recep reception and organization of this culture forum. So Guimarães is a, a, a city on the north of Portugal that has a historic center uh, in the center of the city that is world heritage since 2001. And in 2012, we were European capital of culture, adding an important uh, Art Contemporary Art Center and the Territory Interpretative Center to a very generous list of cultural facilities in the center of the, the city. We also changed our mindset from a city of arts presentation into a city of cultural creation. This year, in 2022, we took another huge step on this direction, opening a former uh, auditorium, in, in a former auditorium, a new school, a high sc uh, uh, superior school of visual arts, of performative arts, and of uh, music uh, uh, conservatory, complementing our public offer uh, of the educational system, where we have art classes for all the children in the public school since the first degree. And also in 2013, Guimarães defined the sustainable development as a central idea of the development model of the city in a very transversal modern model of governance. And we were candidates to European Green Capital in 2020. And in 2022, we were chosen by as one of the 100 smart cities for climate neutrality by the European Commission. So all this uh, being said, it's important too to say that we are talking talking about uh, 158,000 inhabitants municipality with only uh, 20,000 uh, living in the city uh, center. And the other majority of the population are divided between 48 
parishes all over the territory. And also to say that the generation of our grandparents who didn't have elementary education or and they were they were working at agriculture or textile factories since they were kids. So, and also for many years we had a very limited public transportation system, not covering all the territory and with few schedules, especially at night, so we, the people weren't able to consume the mm -hmm. culture that we have in the center of the city. So if we had this great cultural offer at the city center, creative industries based there, but most part of the population living outside of the city. So we have these two uh, main challenges to address, to have better mobility, to gain social inclusion, to invest on the territorial cohesion, cultural and art success, and the sustainability of our cultural projects, pro project. So we created two main measures. Uh, one of them is Eccentricity, Eccentricidade in Portuguese. It's a pro project of cultural decentralization and to new public, and the other one was a new public transportation concession with more schedules and complete coverage of the territory. So about excentricidad, uh, uh, we are talking about cultural programming in nine important parishes of the territory of Guimarães. That is a community co-creation co based program of arts involving the local people, the local tradition, the local heritage with contemporary creations of artists based not only in Guimarães but from all over Portugal. With that, we democratized our, the access to, to art, the sustainability of our cultural policies, the educating and the development, the social developing of, of the territory. And also to complete on transports, we are trying to minimize the use of individual transportation and to gain the people to the public transportation. So the next step, it would be a project that we are developing in order to implement it in the next year, that is the transport on requests in the specific hours to complete this, this public transportation offer. So we want to have the better access to, to, to culture, to more, more sustainable access to culture, joining the two main priorities of our city, cultural and sustainable development. So with small steps, we want to have huge impact on these two, two measures. So thank you all. Thanks a lot for these very concrete examples as well. And uh, last but not least, we have uh, Michela Favoro from uh, Torino. Uh, uh, hello, good morning to everyone. It's not an easy task uh, to be the last one <laughs> before the coffee break. <laughs> so I, I, I will really try to be as quick as possible. But uh, I want to um, uh, thank uh, the, the city of Lille for this amazing uh, hospitality. Um, Turin uh, is uh, so not uh, one of the most famous uh, cities in, in Italy for tourism, but in the last uh, 20 years uh, we increased a lot our attractiveness. Uh, we, we, we hosted in 2006 uh, the Winter Olympic Games, uh, and uh, we, we, uh, the last uh, big uh, cultural event we had in uh, last May was uh, to host the Eurovision Song, to uh, song Contest, and so we, we, are, uh, we have uh, a big experience in uh, organizing and hosting uh, uh, big, ev big uh, cultural events, and uh, we, we also work a lot uh, on the sustainability of these uh, events. We have a policy uh, where we encourage uh, um, the, the organizer and the, or the stakeholder um, to promote uh, the circular economy, to promote the local chain of green and social uh, economy, to promote the biodiversity and uh, avoid uh, food waste, and of course uh, to have uh, low emission uh, and uh, also uh, low use of plastic. Um, another focus in th is uh, on the job conditions of the employee in, uh, in the cultural sector, which is very important uh, to guarantee fair and, uh, um, and uh, good uh, co job, job condition. And uh, also the sponsor. We have uh, a policy uh, to ask uh, the sponsor to uh, embrace uh, our sustainability policies. Uh, um, I was very interested in the, the one of the previous presentation because we are also 
um, asking uh, how to be, be able to measure the environment impact of the great event. Uh, in the last year, we had uh, many projects. Uh, one for all is uh, the Smart Tree project. Uh, we also we um, we try to um, plant a new tree after a, a big event. But it's very important uh, for the political debate uh, to have some uh, data, some figures, uh, to be able to uh, compensate uh, and uh, to organize uh, uh, the event according to, uh, to this data. Um, it is also very important, as other colleague underlined, uh, to involve uh, not only the center of the city, but uh, every neighborhood. Uh, we have this project is Circoscrizione al Centro, which is uh, uh, the project uh, to uh, involve uh, the cultural association uh, all over our city. And uh, the, the, the role of the city is to, um, to support them in uh, working together. Usually the cultural association, they, they want just to, uh, to do their activities. Uh, and they, I, it's very important for the city to create a network and uh, to promote uh, the excellences of every neighborhood. Uh, um, so um, I think uh, that mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, Thanks. I will be happy to, to hear the other experiences. Thank you. Thanks a lot. <laughs> and I will ask you to, to join again your seats. As last, uh, last moment, uh, I will give back the floor to, to Lille, to uh, Marie-Pierre Bresson. Uh, about this call for action from Lille, because as we have mentioned in the very beginning, we are here uh, to listen to the different activities and initiatives, and then th I think they can enrich actually the, this call for action from Lille. And uh, you can count, of course, on the EuroCities team to follow up on the, all these different initiatives to see how we can disseminate them all over uh, Europe, and also how we can see uh, how we can develop some concrete projects funded maybe by the European Union Union to go further and to exchange uh, on how these uh, different initiatives can go further. But uh, now, again, back the floor to Marie-Pierre Bresson about this uh, sustainability uh, uh, charter and uh, the first cities that continue to, to work with you and to sign this charter. Merci beaucoup uh, d'avoir fait tout ce travail avec toutes les Thank you very much for having done all of this work with all of the teams so that we can prepare this charter that's continue, going to continue, I think, uh, to grow inspired by all of these practices. Thank you very much. Now, I know that everyone's dying to get off for the coffee break. I just wanted to say how delighted we are to be able to welcome you here and host this event. And it's not the first time that we have hosted an event for European cities to speak about uh, climate change, and especially our twin cities, because in 2018, when we organized uh, a uh, festival for international solidarity, which was dedicated uh, to the 65th anniversary of European construction. We already invited our twin towns so that we could talk about what we would do afterwards and what's ahead of us. And we wanted to focus on climate change, and you will admit that it is a question of international solidarity that's compulsory. In the same way, Europe, uh, uh, you can see that uh, Lille is a European city, and Europe is at the heart of our concerns as well. In Oslo, the town uh, was finalist for the European Green Capital. And it wasn't so obvious given the, its history and its territory, but it was a way of involving the city in a policy for transition, which was really ambitious. And that's where the idea of the utopia season came from. And I won't come back to that because the mayor already spoke about it. Now, this summer, and again at the moment, you can see the impact of uh, climate change and we know that uh, time is limited for us to be able to act. Uh, and it's on that question that we dedicated the utopia session because it really is essential. The mayor was saying this morning that uh, it's full of recommendations. The actors and artists were saying that the world that it is and the world that's going to become is so important. And we can work on all of those questions. We can use those questions to act. And so 
when we applied uh, to organize this uh, cultural formal, forum on sustainable culture, we were convinced of the fact that we would be able, on a European level, because we know that it's the territories who will make a difference, we know that acting locally really is essential, we were convinced uh, that we were going to be able to attempt uh, to use a critical mass so that we could change things. And that's the reason why we suggested that we should uh, co a call to action. Uh, so this call to action in Lille is based on the two pillars which uh, cannot be separated in terms of climate change. First of all, questions with regards to the environment, they're the hard questions, and then those that con concern inclusivity and integration, and they're the soft issues. I'm not going to go into the detail about all of them, but for those two pillars, we have made a lot of suggestions, we have uh, defined our priorities, and I'm going to be presenting them very quickly. Obviously, we have to preserve our resources, we have to think about energy in our buildings, we have to think about travel, and we have spoken about that a lot, uh, travel of works and artists, but also the general public. We also have to think about responsible purchasing, a circular economy, and also training, training with regards to the challenges of the environment and how important it is to train people within each local authority and facility, all of the people who are going to be able to lead all of these themes. The second pillar uh, is that of inclusion because we, all of us, have said today that we can't carry out our ecological transition without uh, the social preoccupation, whether we call it solidarity or inclusion, whatever it may be. All of this is aimed at the people or the population that we belong to, and all of that has got to be part of this uh, approach. And that's why this second pillar, which is dedicated to inclusion, has a priority whereby we have to enable access to cultural programs for everyone that uh, so that we can correct uh, social and cultural inequality and geographical technological inequalities again. We have to develop ambitious projects which are in favor of vulnerable populations. And we know that when we work on vulnerability, which uh, starts uh, in childhood and goes right through to old age, there are times in life when we become vulnerable. And when we work on vulnerability and try to improve it, then we work on universal inclusion. And then after that, as you said earlier on, we have to try and include questions linked to gender, and we have to include uh, citizens' participation. They are the two pillars and also the priorities uh, that we have given ourselves so that we can start working and make a difference uh, and so that we can embark upon systemic action because we can't simply add on to experiences which are all very interesting. We know today that we have to roll out on a major scale actions that are going to be systemic, and we think that uh, the scale of European cities is a, a very good way of doing so. That's why I would like to call upon the four representatives of our twin towns who are here today, Madame Farfaro. You've just left uh, the Mrs. Lennox, and Mr. Heidebouffe-Liege, and Mr. Sidinski for Rotswurf, because together and with other cities as well, you'll see the names coming up. They're all represented on a technical level. If you'd like to come up onto the stage with me, I would be delighted uh, to be able to have you with me here. Now, you can see the twin cities. We have the twin cities of the city of Lille, who are all committed and have embarked upon this uh, call sent out by Lille, and I'd invite them to all come and join me so that uh, we can invite you, who are here, to join us so that we can work together in a working group uh, with the EuroCities Forum, which is dedicated to culture, so that we can work on improving and enriching this call so that we're going to be able to share it with others. This call, which will gather together, I hope, a large number of European cities. I hope that it's going to be an opportunity to do what uh, we do the best in Europe, and that's lobbying with all of the European institutions, so that we'll be able to make a difference, because together it will be possible. I'd just like to add, as you will have understood, uh, I would like to think of uh, Cardiff, who uh, uh, said that they would be stakeholders for this call, but uh, the first urgency is to rebuild and uh, then build it in the most sustainable way possible. Now, yet again, I'm delighted 
to be able to invite you to participate in this movement uh, which uh, we are undertaking together. And I'd also like to thank all of our European partners. And I would like to thank uh, all of the team here from Eurocities and the team of international relations and culture from the city of Lille who have worked on this call. They shared it with others and they're going to continue to share it with you. And uh, I'd like to wish you all excellent work here in Lille. Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, you can count on the support of Eurocity, the whole team, uh, and uh, the uh, first signatories to uh, further enrich uh, this uh, call for action and, uh, of course, to promote it also uh, at the European institutions. It's also the role of Eurocities, and uh, it's very interesting to see that this forum is not a way where we can change about practices, but where we have some concrete outcomes afterwards. And, uh, of course, we can then follow up and measure, because it was also mentioned, what is the impact of these kind of concrete elements and maybe also to find some projects funded by the European Commission that can help us to uh, further improve this charter. So now uh, there's uh, finally this uh, expected uh, coffee break. Uh, I was asked to ask you to keep the headphones on your seats and to take them back afterwards. So don't take the headphones with you outside. Uh, leave them here and we will then continue further the discussion. Thanks a lot. Uh, excuse me, everybody, as we are really late, I will ask you to have a, only a 15 minutes coffee break. I'm really sorry. So if everybody can come back by noon uh, precisely, because we are really short on the program. Thank you very much, everybody. Yeah. 